join for free. And kids in every neighborhood belong. It's funny company, cause it's just for fun, you see. So come a running when you hear our song. Come to order, come to order, says our president. And when the funny company beats here, guess what we present? Things to be. And things to do. Une pomme aussi, s'il vous plaît. Oh, oui, monsieur, merci. Yeah, it is a nice day, sir. Terry, he's a French sailor, and he said he wants an apple, too. Oh. Gee, fellas, we're doing very well with our fresh fruit stand. Yeah, these merchant marine sailors can really eat. That Navy bridge is really coming along fast. Oh, look at those men up there so high. They're called high steel men. Boy, I'll say they're high. And I'm feeling very low. You know, I got to get out of this country, change the scenery. These funny company brats give me inferiority complex. Hey, look, an ocean liner. Wish we were going somewhere. We'd have a big stateroom on the ship. Stateroom? That's what you call the cabins or rooms people stay in aboard ship. Maybe I go back to old country on ship. They say half the fun is in the going. Oh, look, that man on the end of that hook. Don't worry about him. He's used to it. Oh, what if he fell? Depending on how high he is, he might make a nice dive out of it. If he were experienced. He could. He could. Why, sure. One of the most spectacular and thrilling attractions in Mexico are the famous cliff divers of Acapulco. These are a group of native boys who dive into the shallow, rock-strewn ocean from the towering heights of La Quebrada, a cliff that rises to several hundred feet above the sea. Whoa-wee! Wow! Before each incoming wave, the waters below La Quebrada are as little as four or five feet deep. But each wave brings in another two or three feet of water. Each diver must time his perilous leap with the incoming wave. Oh, isn't that scary? The climb up La Quebrada is nearly as hazardous as the dive. One misstep and the diver would fall to the jagged rocks below. Wow! The patron saint of the cliff diver is Guadalupe, and a shrine to Saint Guadalupe stands alongside the path to the top of the cliff. When a cliff diver reaches his platform high atop La Quebrada, he may look below, making careful observations of the incoming waves. He notices their height and their frequency. He then makes his calculations as to the best time to dive. He nods to the starter below. The starter signals the beginning of the inbound wave. The diver leaps, throwing his body out a distance of 12 feet or more in order to miss the jutting face of the cliff. Wow-wee! Gee, you'd take your little life in your little own hands doing that. Ooh, boy! That's it, I'll snitch Violet and watch. <coughs> what the, it's Violet! Look, Belly Laguna. You better stop him, boys. He's headed for the top of the bridge. I think he's finally flipped. Oh, you let me go, you... Oh, Tootsie, I've got the master plan for you. Look. Look, what are you gonna do? See ship, see swimming pool on deck. I hear about high divers, and I dive into pool as ship goes under bridge. Hey, well, well, go ahead. But I take you with me. Oh. I take you and your shrinking secret out of the country. Ha! <laughs> What is it? Uh, I eat a banana and then think small. So that's it. Well, I'll just. Change your mind about leaving the country, Mr. Laguna? Yes, dear. <laughs> I didn't like my stateroom. Cause it's just for fun, you see. So come a running when you hear our song.
to do. Sorry, Mom! Boys! All sorts of things of interest and fun for girls and boys! It's me, Belly Laguna, and this is my cousin, Sleepy Laguna. He wants to be assistant bad guy. <sighs> Mean old Billy Laguna. I better find out what he's up to. Okay, here's the picture. This is Funny Company Clubhouse. Inside are a bunch of do-good brats. You'll hate them. Oh, he's so awful. And they invent things. See, on table next to window are plans to new invention. <sighs> now, you see this vacuum cleaner? Well, I'll go inside, you stay here and listen, and when I say now, you turn on the vacuum cleaner, the plans will go in, and we get them. Remember, when I say now. Oh, I better warn the gang. How now, brown cow? That's good, Terry. Well, we actors have to keep in practice. Good diction is important, Terry, but some actors don't talk at all. Right, Dr. Todd? That's right, Jasper. As part of any actor's training, be he young or old, the whole art of expressing your feelings and emotions by facial expression and bodily movement is very important. When you tell a story wholly without words, using your facial expression and bodily movements alone, this is called pantomime. So when young people are learning to act, they're called upon to pretend how they'd behave if they got, say, a happy telephone call. They all take turns doing it in front of each other. <laughs> I'd be embarrassed. <laughs> well, well, you'd have to get over that. That's why you practice. And then the teacher comments and makes suggestions on how to improve your work. And then you are given another pretend exercise. Be very, very sad. Oh, you're so sad at some news you got, and your face shows it, and you bow your head and slump your shoulders. Yeah, it's only make-believe sad. <laughs> right. And then you act out whole little stories, all in preparation for really putting on a play for lots of people in a theater. Oh, that's for me! And you see, to help communicate in addition to the words of the play, the actions and expressions of all the actors help tell the story more clearly of a joyful meeting, and an introduction of friends, and modesty, and all the range of human experience. Maybe I would have fun acting. Huh, how about that? Listen, everybody, Billy Laguna's coming, and he's gonna go... He's gonna do a oh. vacuum cleaner, eh? I see when Billy says no. Oh, oh I got an idea. Listen. Yeah, 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 Hello, darling people. It's me, the new good guy, Belly Laguna. Oh, hi, Mr. Laguna. Shh, here he is. Okay, Terry, take it again. <clears throat> How new, brown cow? What's he doing? He's practicing his diction for the stage. Wait, he said that wrong. Here, let old actor show you. Oh, fine. Would you get on our stage, please? <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, listen. <laughs> How now, brown cow? And away he goes! <laughs> Sleepy, stop! Forget that we lost again! Ooh, it's dark in here. And now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then, cause now you're in the funny company! We have a company that you can join for free, and kids in every neighborhood belong! It's the funny company, cause it's just for fun, you see! So come a running when you hear our song! And things to do. Sorry, Mom. Boys. All sorts, sorts of things of interest. And fun for girls and boys. Gee, we can't just 
Or what's holding him up? Probably his legs. Oh, oh, oh here he comes now. Oh, I'm sorry I'm tardy, kids, but the climb up the hill is breathtaking. We should have had our soapbox derby car. Oh, it's too hard to push uphill, Terry. Besides, it's dangerous. The car might roll backwards and accidentally knock somebody down. Buzzer's right. Statistics show one man is knocked down by a car every five seconds. Gee, that man must be made of steel. <laughs> That's me, a steel man. Man, I steal anything. Yes, sirree. The roads are getting so jammed with cars these days, it'd be safer driving through the air. That's it, our new project. An aerial cable car. We can sell tickets for sightseeing excursions, and the funny company will have transportation up the hill. Yeah. Oh, you mean like the Palm Springs Tramway? I've heard of an oak having acorns, but a palm with springs, this I gotta see. <laughs> <laughs> well, Palm Springs is a very nice place with natural water springs to feed thirsty palms. And there's an aerial tramway there that goes up, 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 thousands of feet up a mountainside to a completely different kind of climate. Boy, I bet it'll be cold up there. Well, wait and see. Cables are hung between towers that were built up the mountainside. The aerial tram car will run up these cables. You get in down at the bottom of this canyon, almost on the floor of this big desert area. The desert that was once the bottom of a prehistoric sea. Huh. Then up you go in your tram car over jagged rocks and pinnacles, and I want to tell you, the scenery is wonderful. The view is breathtaking. Gee! As you go up, other cars are coming down. The people in them have already been to the top, where you're going to land. You're hundreds of feet up, and trees grow here because the air and climate are moist, unlike the desert below. And there's snow on the ground up here, and only a few minutes ago, you might have been in a year-round swimming pool in the desert. And then you go back down, and once in a while, you get a little jolt or bump when your tram car rolls over cable joints or connections. Oh, that's kind of scary when that happens. But very safe. And then you're back where you started on your ride on the aerial tramway. In just a few short minutes, it brought you to and from completely different climates and environment. You have just enjoyed a ride on the world's longest aerial tramway. No other can come near it in length. And what have we got here in the funny company? My goodness, the world's smallest aerial cable car. But is it safe? Yes, sir. Besides, I installed rubber shock absorbers and a powerful brake that will stop the car on a dime. Oh, boy, then I'll stop the car and steal the dime, too. Here are the crew assignments. Terry will point out the sights with his tail. <laughs> Super Chief will be the horn. <laughs> and Billy Laguna will be our test pilot. Hey, kids, look, no hands. Oh. Look, kids, no head. <laughs> oh, what a colorful test pilot. <laughs> oh, black and blue. <laughs> oh, I don't mind the speed. <laughs> But the sudden stop, a murder! Hey, kids, get me down from here, please! Give me a break! Anything you say, Mr. Laguna, here's your play! Oh! I never win against these kids. Gee, Mr. Laguna, have an accident? Uh, no, thank you, sweetheart. I just had one! <laughs> Now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company. We have a company. You can join for free, and kids in every neighborhood belong. It's the funny company, cause it's just for fun, you see. So come a running when you hear our song. Come to order, come to order, says the president. And when the funny company meets here, guess what we we get? Things to see. And things to do. Sorry. Fun. Gallop 
sleeping goulash belly baby. This is going to be your day. Look, eyeballs, is that something to steal? Oh, where do you want these jewels and precious stones from Harry Tiffin's credit jewelers? Right here, my good. Oh, the costs are going to break us. Real jewels for a make-believe movie. Please, for a picture by me, Anatole Litmus, nothing is funny. Well, time costs money. Speed it up. All right. Now, Violet, you and your daddy, famous explorer, played by famous actor by Cuspid. Oh, how nice of you, Anatole. Really? Please, the crew, the set, the money, hurry! Philistine, all right. Violet, little daughter and papa find King Solomon's mine shaft. There. And all the jewels and gold from his treasure. Oh, my, how exciting! Yes, but wait. Your papa was hurt, and he is out like a light. Hmm, he's too real. But you, Violet, build campfire and keep him warm and give you light in the jungle, right? Oh, I'm scared. All right, so you are sleepy yourself, and then these giant African snails attack you. Oh, giant African snails. Oh, boy, is this fake. <laughs> oh, not necessarily, Terry. Giant African snails? So big they can scare a little girl? <laughs> well, there are snails that are no bigger than the head of a pen. And then there are giant African snails that measure up to two feet long. Two feet? Good gravy! The regular garden snail is small by comparison. Oh, the snail is a fascinating animal. It's classified as a gastropod, a mollusk, and usually has a spiral shell and a broad, flat foot. A foot? Oh, goodness! Well, that's that big muscular base that the snail stands on and uses to crawl along. His eyes are out on ends of long tentacles like, which he can wave around and point in whatever direction he wants to look. To blink or wink, he pulls his whole eye inside this branch, just like you'd pull your hand up inside the sleeve of your coat. Hey, how about that? Snails feed on plants or on animal matter, and some are edible and many are not. There are freshwater snails, saltwater snails, tree snails, and land snails. When the land snail crawls, he produces a sticky solution that serves as a roadway. You can sometimes see his glistening track. The muscles of its foot move in a rippling motion, just like the legs of a caterpillar. Huh, how about that? But that sticky solution protects the snail against injury. It is so protective that a snail can crawl up, up and over the edge of a sharp, sharp razor blade without even cutting himself. Oh, mercy, Dr. Todd. Boy, he better not dance the cha-cha-cha or he'll be a snail, snail, snail. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we ready? Ready, Mr. Litmus. How about the giant snails, the fake ones? The motors are running, Mr. Litmus. This is it. I climb under one of these shells, make like a mechanical snail, go over to where treasure is, and <laughs> eat a few jewels. Ready? Stop them up. Oh, these, these are 12 times bigger than those giant snails really are. Phony. Ha-ha, <laughs> I'm getting closer. I can see glow of jewels right ahead. Look, that snail, it's headed for the campfire. Ha, 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 pretty diamonds, I... Oh, 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 oh! That snail sure is cooperating, Mr. T-Berry. How so? Well, he must have heard you say you wanted the show speeded up. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs>
visor hats on. There. Is everybody present? Oh, but Jasper National Park. Oh. Terry, will you see what that awful noise is? It's Jasper. He's in a helicopter. A helicopter? Where did you get that? I invented it, naturally. It's a simple principle of the airfoil rotated at high velocity. Oh, good grief, he's off again. Hey, you came from home in that thing? Had to. Couldn't find my skate key. Well, come on down. You're holding up the meeting. Certainly. I'll just... Hey, I'll go up and give our brainy buddy a hand. Please, Terry. I'd rather do it myself. Oh, sorry. I just stopped pedaling and... Hmm, a slight miscalculation. Boy, you could use some flying lessons. We came down, didn't we? Oh, look at that pile of stuff. My, oh, my, that reminds me of some of the early planes that man tried his wings in. Hmm, yes, I saw several of the early aircraft at the Air Museum. They had lots of planes from World War I. Well, after the war, some of those planes, like the Curtis Jenny, were sold to barnstormers, people who put on air shows and did daredevil air stunts. Oh, the Jenny is quite a plane. Its top speed was 75 miles an hour. In 1918, the U.S. Post Office started an air route between New York and Philadelphia to try the idea of carrying mail by air. The run was flown by Army pilots flying these old jennies, some of the first planes to successfully prove the usefulness of air transportation to the American public. They fought in the World War I. Hmm. Yes, they didn't start out that way. You see, planes were used to observe enemy ground troops. The Germans had a plane called the Fokker, a triplane with three wings. It had a maximum speed of 110 miles per hour. It had a great climb rate and maneuverability, which was needed in dogfights. Dogfights? Yes. When enemy pilots on reconnaissance first passed each other, they used to wave. Then, someone took to pot-shotting at the enemy with pistols. And then they put machine guns on these planes and fought each other in the air. Dogfights? Gee! But now these planes are retired and flying them is much safer. Uh, well, um, <laughs> almost. Wowee, look! For heaven's sakes. Gee, that Jenny really piled up. Boy, I'll say, it'll take a long time to put that plane together again. Even the most careful hobbyist in this fun-filled pastime of collecting and keeping old planes can come a cropper with an accident. Luckily, no one was seriously injured. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad no one was hurt. Anyone want to buy a slightly used airplane? <laughs> Anyone want to buy a slightly used helicopter? Why, what are you going to do now, Jasper? I'm going to build an airplane. That's what I'm going to do. But, Jasper, you still don't know much about flying. I do so. Sure he does, Dr. Todd. He made a flight at a very early age. Oh, sure. He's a veteran flyer. I am. When did he fly before? When the start brought him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not very humorous. <laughs> well, it is a bit, but I am. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company. We have a company that you can join for free And kids in every neighborhood belong It's the funny company Cause it's just for fun, you see So come a running when you hear our song And things to do. Sorry. Fun. Toys. All sorts of things of interest. And fun for girls and boys. <laughs> <laughs> I found.
followed those funny company brats all the way here. The Amazon jungle. Ooh, I'm so excited, my stomach is upset. Ooh, look, I've got poison darts and blowgun, and I'm going to finish them off and get all the money that rich dame is carrying with her to make foolish movie. Oh, I'm so excited, Mr. T-Berry. Oh, I think it's just wonderful that you put up the money to make this movie, Miss Wellborn. But now poor Terry is sick, and he's supposed to be the Birdman in our movie about the Amazon princess. Stupid child, all you need is me, Gloria Excelsior, star of stage, screen, and radio. Please, no bickering. Enough has gone wrong with this picture already. Terry's sick and... You nasty green bird. I told you to take a hot bath and lots of orange juice. Did you drink your orange juice yet? I haven't finished drinking a hot bath yet. <laughs> I'll finish them off with this poison dart. Oh, look at all the little fishies. Yes, these are piranha-infested waters. Oh, piranha. What is that? Oh, they're tiny little fish that are very bloodthirsty. Oh, this jungle. It's horrible and ferocious. Oh, Miss Excelsior, the creatures of the Amazon jungle are very interesting. Oh, brother, even when I'm sick, this kid talks, talks, talks. I would like to tell you about some of the animals we might see. As, for instance, the taper. It is very much like a hog or a forest pig. Actually, a taper looks kind of like a cross between an anteater, an elephant, a hog, a rhinoceros, and a hippopotamus. <laughs> Can't make up his mind, I guess. He's very fat, and some natives do eat taper meat. Another interesting animal you will see is the bird called the macaw. Macaw, macaw, macaw. <laughs> very funny. At any rate, the macaw is a beautiful bird, and you will see many of them in pet stores and in zoos throughout the world. Now, there is one animal that we must be very cautious about, and that is the boa constrictor. The jungle has many, many kinds of boa constrictors. What do you mean, a snake-like? Look! Yipes! Now, there are tree boas, meaning boa constrictors that like to be in trees and live in trees. Boy, do they bite you? No, a boa constrictor will grab on you and wrap himself around you and strangle you, squeeze you until the life has left you. You will suffocate because you can't breathe. What do you mean me? He's not going to get within 10 feet of me, my friend. Well, fortunately, boa constrictors aren't very fast, but that's how they get their prey. Oh, what a terrible beast. Oh, he is that. I'm certainly glad we don't have any scenes calling for a boa constrictor. There are plenty around here, so we'd better be careful. It stopped raining. Oh, Keen team, we can shoot the scene where Gloria Excelsior and Shrink and Violet are rescued from the piranha-infested river by Reba the Birdman. Uh, feeling up to it, Terry? I'll try, Mr. T-Berry. <laughs> and I will dump those two little girls, and while everybody is trying to save them, I will steal Miss Wellborn's suitcase full of movie money. <laughs> I didn't say action. That's not Terry Dactyl. Who's that nasty Billy Laguna? I hate to work with amateurs. It's a shame you ruined that scene, Mr. T. Berry. Ruined it? Oh, my boy, keep that camera rolling. <laughs> <laughs>
my fine little Miss Shrinking Violet. You are finally captured, and if the forces of evil don't want you, I hold you for ransom till Funny Company pays for you. Oh, I'm so frightened. I'll just... <laughs> Go ahead and shrink. I just put you in bottle. There. Goodbye till later. I... Oh, boy. If I'm going to be no one, got to get more class. Oh, my, what can I do? I'm so scared I can't grow, and I'm too small to push that cork out. And no good Billy Laguna. He sneaked up from behind and tied me up and took Shrink and Violet. And he said we'd be hearing from him, huh? I'll bet he's going to hold her for ransom. Where, though? Well, not where he lives at Mrs. Rich's, that's for certain. Hey, hey, coming in from Jenkins' farm on my bike about twilight yesterday, I noticed a light on in the old Grimes' house. That's haunted! The Grimes are all gone. Bet that's where he's got her. Come on, gang! First, let's call the police and have them meet us there. I... Oh. Here! Maybe I can just walk this little bottle along. I... Be much further. Yeah, couldn't Violet shrink down and escape? Oh, I'd be afraid. Little like that. The bugs and snakes and rats. She might get in worse trouble. Yeah, oh, yeah. Spiders and ants? And if she ever fell in an ant lion's trap, that would be the end of her. Why? What do you mean? What's an ant lion, for gosh sakes? It's the larval form of a certain kind of insect. Sometimes they call it the doodle bug. A doodle bug? <laughs> That's funny. Well, this larva goes down into loose earth or sand, or sandy ground, and he buries himself. He likes it best living out this stage of his life, the larval stage, in this underground home. But he's hungry, so he builds a trap. He makes a funnel-shaped hole in the ground above him. Hey, how about that? He's pretty smart, and boy, is he a hard worker. Right. Again and again and again sort of combs the side of the hole above him until he has a nice funnel-shaped hole that goes right down to him. Well, so Mr. Ant comes walking along, and if he stays clear of the funnel, he'll be all right. But if he starts to slip on the edge of that funnel, well, the more he struggles, the more sandy soil gives way, and it's just like a slide, and down he goes into that ant lion's waiting jaws. That Poor old ant. Well, that's just how the ant lion lives and traps his food. Gee, how about that? Then he starts all over again, smoothing out the sides of the same hole. Or maybe he'll move for one reason or another to another hole and start building the trap all over again. And there are plenty of ants to keep him supplied with victims and dinners. And he has a good appetite. Boy, you can say that again. But it sure helps keep the ant population down. Hey, what's that on the porch? Yeah, lavender color. It's violet. Oh, mercy, I'm safe. And here come the police. We found her, Sergeant Turnkey. And we found this no good. <coughs> Boom! Off to jail. See, already I got class. Got chauffeur driving me around. <coughs> oh, please, I'd rather do that myself. Oh, oh I'm so stupid. <coughs> oh, I'll never learn. Oh, I hit too hard. And now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Because now you're in the funny company. Everybody, 
job delivering eggs from Mrs. Hawkins' farm. So I guess we'll have to buy some egg baskets. Gee, Buzzer, we can't buy any baskets. Our treasury's too low. Maybe we could weave our own. How do you weave an egg? Not eggs, baskets. Gosh, no money, no baskets. No baskets, no money. Him say, you don't need wampum. Indian people make own baskets. How? How? Jerry means how, not how. How do they make baskets? This I got to see. It looks complicated. How long does it take to make one? Only one fiftieth of a second. To make a perfect basket? No, to make a perfect picture. Uh, thank you, Jasper. You're so helpful. Well, if you'd really like to know, it's quite interesting. Uh-oh, here we go again. Polly, you should know better than to get Jasper started. The Indian women of Arizona are quite adept at basket making. First, they get branches or long whips of certain kinds of shrubs, bushes, or trees. They could use willow. Then, after the leaves and twigs have been stripped from the main whip, they split the whip into two or three parts. It's not quite like peeling a banana, although it looks as easy. They don't use the bark, they use the whole fiber. Oh, it's, it's like wicker or uh, rattan. Rattan? Wicker and rattan and paint are all vegetable fiber materials used in making baskets and chair seats and, and all kinds of things. Oh, you're pretty smart at that kind of stuff yourself, Buzzer. Geez, thanks, Terry. And so, these Indian women weave the baskets, forming the base first and building up the sides next. They weave in darker strips that they've dyed with color, and that way they make their pretty Indian designs. You know, Jasper, it is interesting. I told you so. You all give me a hard time once in a while. <laughs> okay, JP, no sermons. <laughs> well, anyhow, that's how you weave baskets. And I've heard that some baskets can be woven so tightly that they can be used to carry water. Yeah, and woven so round you can play with them. Play with them? Sure, you've heard of basketball, haven't you? Oh, Terry! <laughs> <laughs> you know, those baskets are really keen. Keen with our own handmade baskets. Now everything we earn from delivering eggs will be profit. No overhead. Except me, I'm overhead. Gonna steal Bunny Company's baskets and corner the basket market. Pretty soon Easter bunnies won't have Easter baskets. Families won't have picnic baskets. Kids won't have basketballs. Then everyone will have to buy Belly's baskets. <laughs> hey, look who just dropped in. <laughs> it's that little old basket stealer, me. Anybody that would steal from kids is a rotten egg. Not only am I rotten, but I'm a hard-boiled egg, too. Oh, no, you don't. Fire! Shell the enemy, Get everybody! It Get it! Mr. Laguna, you're not hard-boiled now. You're scrambled. Oh, these kids! Have I got egg on my face? That's right, Mr. Laguna. Yolk's on you! <laughs> and now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company! I've always needed. 
Someone to smell for me. Uh, I'll train him to sniff and locate money. Somebody else's. <laughs> Here, doggy. Nice, doggy. There, that's what money smells like. <laughs> hey, you miserable mutt. That's a hundred dollars. Come back here. <laughs> <laughs> Serves Billy right. Yeah, how bet he's teaching that dog to steal. <laughs> Gee, could that dog really smell money? Dogs have a very keen sense of smell, especially hound dogs. And the Basset is one of the breeds of hound dogs. When he's first born, the Basset is one of the cutest little dogs you've ever seen. Basset hounds are hunting dogs, bred down from cousins of the bloodhound, called St. Hubert hounds, back in the 15th century France. The reason they were bred down in size was that ladies in those days rode side saddle and were unable to keep up with the fast, long-legged St. Hubert hounds. The word Basset comes from the French ba, meaning low, and terre, to the ground. Hmm, ba, terre. Basset, terre, basset, basset, oh, I see. Bloodhounds are supposed to have bloodshot eyes. Queen Victoria had the first bassets in England. The French bassets had more of the look of a beagle hound before they were crossed with the bloodhound in England. Shakespeare describes the basset hounds in Midsummer Night's Dream. George Washington had the first pair of bassets in the United States, which were given to him by the Marquis de Lafayette. <laughs> Lafayette, we are here. The carved bronze statue of the St. Hubert Hounds is 150 years old. Note the brand on the side. The nobility always used to brand their hounds to identify them. Gee! The brown and black adult Basset is a four-year-old champion named Napoleon. Isn't he pretty? Deacon, who is all brown, is his second cousin and three and a half years old. Oh, isn't he cute? The pups are Sister Carrie, seven months, Basil Bone Ba, meaning good and low, five months. He sure is good and low. Malcolm Motheridge, three months, and Jezebel, seven weeks. All these pups were sired by Napoleon. That means he's their father. Hey, look, who's this coming? Say, did any of you children lose a hundred dollar bill? Where did you get it? From a dog, Happy. That's Happy? Oh, well, now, about this hundred dollar bill. Ah, that's my hundred dollars. Give it to me. He didn't even say please. Madam, may I have my hundred dollars back, if you don't mind, please? This is your hundred dollar bill? I can prove it by these kids. And kids, I don't hate you now. No, that's right. Okay, right, that's right. We saw the dog take it. Well, it's an absolute fake, a counterfeit. And you're under arrest. Oh, that's what you think, Granny. Sit him, Happy. Oh, oh, oh. Happy? They should call him Sharpie. Oh. And now, I'll just wrap this up. Hey, where did you learn that judo? It's from years with the Treasury Department, Sonny. I started with Alexander Hamilton. Oh, my goodness. What's the matter? What are you doing? I'm putting on my skates. I'm already ten minutes late for my surfboard lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Hi ho, silver wheels! And away! <laughs>
Oh boy, now these funny company kids are building radio station. Maybe I can get at controls and send messages to the forces of evil. How's it coming, Dr. Todd? We still have some tinkering to do before we can try broadcasting. Well, meanwhile, let's catalog our music records. Catalog? Yeah, we've got to put the music in order so we can use it as a library. Well, music is music, isn't it? Yeah, but this way, if we're doing a radio play and we'd need mystery music, we could find it more easily. Here's one. It's called Movie Chase. Well, sounds like an old comedy with a keystone cop. Terry, that's your cue. I'll make the lights flicker like the movies used to. Just think, with our radio station, we can tell the whole world how much fun we have. <laughs> this radio station will be lucky if we're heard in the next block. Maybe we could use Telstar. Telstar? What's that? Oh, it's a wonderful thing that's happened to link the world together in even better communication. See, if I could get at controls, I could reach world capitals with my poisonous messages. The Telstar idea really started with the Echo Satellite. As you know, we send and receive television pictures through the air in electrical waves and beams. Now we can send them for great distances across the world by bouncing those signals off satellites that are spinning around the Earth. Oh, this got its start with Project Echo when a big inflated balloon, a man-made moon, as high as a 10-story building was put into orbit around the Earth. An aluminized balloon, all shiny. You mean they fill it with gas and let it go up? Oh my, no. It was sent up in a rocket. The balloon was deflated at the start, and when the rocket got in orbit, the nose part separated, and the balloon was inflated. And as it spins around the Earth, television and other signals are sent up, beamed at the balloon, and they bounce off of it and back down to Earth, and are caught by giant antennae. But you can only do that at certain times in Echo's orbiting cycle. You mean only when it was at a spot between the sending and receiving points where the signal could be bounced? Well, that's right. So then there came this idea of sending up a sending and receiving satellite and putting it at such a height above the Earth so that it goes around at the same speed as the Earth. That way it would stay in one spot above the Earth. And if you had three such satellites above the Earth at equal distances and generally above the equator, why, you'd have constant mirrors or receiving and sending stations. And then you could send signals at any time, all the time. Mm-hmm. There are cables under the sea to carry telephone messages and other messages. But at the rate the world is increasing the communication among countries and people, there aren't enough cables. So these satellites can be used to carry all kinds of communications. And we'll all get to know each other better. Gee, and you mean right here we've got the power to communicate all around the world? Part of the power, Terry. Oh, but don't touch those switches. You'll get a terrible shock. Ha <laughs> ha! Guess who, kiddies? While you are hanky-panky with corny music and electronic lessons, I, Benny Laguna, getting ready to bounce secret spy messages to the forces of evil. Stand back while I turn on power. I want to... Oh! <laughs> 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 Look! <laughs> His eyeballs have a tan pattern. I wonder how far away they're picking him up. I don't know, but turn his nose and see what's on the other channel. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company. We have a company that you can join for free. And kids in every neighborhood belong. It's the funny company, cause it's just for fun, you see. So come on running when you hear our song. Come to order, come to order, says our president. And when the funny company meets, you guess what we present? Things to see. And things to do. Sorry. Fun. Boys. All sorts of things. things of interest. And fun for girls and boys. <laughs> Oh boy, 
nice seafood dinner on boardwalk. Nice vacation from dirty work. Waiter, do you serve crabs? Oh, we serve anyone, mister. Uh, sit down. <laughs> oh, boy. Boy, Jasper, this is your best invention yet. I'll say. Oh, my, yes, it's wonderful. No, if it just works in the surf. Better not let anyone see it. They'll steal the idea, and then the funny company won't be able to sell them. Here, there are some steps that lead from the boardwalk down to the beach. And we'll give your invention a try. No invention? Maybe you should skip vacation after all. Uh, but why is it so small, Jasper? Well, I didn't have enough aluminum to make a big surfboard, so I made a small one. But if it works all right for shrink and violet, we'll make regular size ones. I'll shrink a little so I'm just right. Oh, boy! Hollow aluminum surfboard. Now that's an idea. It's light, won't break, won't rust. Hot diggity duggity. I'll swim out and steal it from Violet as soon as I finish my lobster. Ouch! <laughs> oh, my. There are some men who will see your invention. Oh, they're just surf fishermen. Surf fishermen? Uh, yes, most likely casting for bluefish. Gee, don't they ever have any violet fish? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, that's a good one, Violet. But bluefish surf fishing is so much fun, I don't think the fishermen ever bother fishing for violet fish. <laughs> <laughs> one of the great places for this great sport is on the very tip of Long Island in New York State at Montauk Point. There's a big lighthouse there that warns away transatlantic steamships and other vessels that are making their way toward the port of New York or into Long Island Sound. Oh, what's that sound? Oh, that's the foghorn of the lighthouse. And on nice foggy mornings, you'll see many surf fishermen come out to try their luck with the bluefish, and people come on fishing boats to lie offshore and try their hand, too. Oh, my, yes. The casting of the fishing line into the oncoming surf takes quite a knack. And when those big blue fish bite, it's quite a fight. And they are beauties. But you don't always land them, and sometimes they get away with hook, line, and sinker. But I tell you, there's nothing to make a real surf fisherman's heart happier than a great big catch of bluefish lying on the beach. <laughs> and that's what those men are doing. And the tide's coming in, so we better get on with our experiment. Well, here goes. Swim out away and wait for a good wave. Well, here goes. I swim out away and torpedo that little shrieker and steal her aluminum surfboard. <laughs> Okay, Violet. There's a big one behind you. Catch it. Okay, boys. Okay, don't Belly Laguna! Catch Violet! She's safe. Well, if we can't sell your invention to surfboarders, we can sell it to dentists. Dentists? <laughs> Have you ever seen a better filling for a big cavity? <laughs> <laughs>
sniveling. What did I do now? I'm not sniveling. <laughs> Say, it's... Shrinking Violet. What's the matter, little one? That mean old Juniper Snodgrass and Billy Laguna, they threw mud at me and pulled my hair. Well, I'm not going to let them get away with that. Oh, no, kid, don't. It's not your cup of tea. Oh, I can't look. Oh, boy, look. <laughs> Mop up the sidewalk with him, Juniper, my boy. Yeah. <laughs> I say, did you, uh... Ah, take that! I'll oh. tell you what... Oh. 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 <laughs> Jiggers, those Indians. Uh, them not get far. We catch them and scalp them. No, fellas. This is just between us kids. Only I can't fight very well. Sure, you plenty brainy anyhow. I told you, my friend. You know, you've got the right name, a Weisenheimer. No, I'm for you. I don't know why. Now, here's a young man like yourself who's been accosted by a bully, a big kid who doesn't believe in picking on someone his own size. But that's life, team. Now, I'm not saying that if you learn boxing, you should be foolhardy, but if you know a little bit about boxing, you'll sure find out whether that big guy is really tough or just a bully with no character. Now, you should have boxing instructions, and one of the first things you'll learn is defensive tactics in boxing, how to protect yourself. And sometimes, a good defense is as much as you need until help comes, or until your opponent gets tired, or decides that you're pretty tough, too. Now, keep that guard up. If you're a left-hander, that means keep that right arm and fist up to ward off blows. If you're a right-hander, keep the left up, but keep it up. Another thing is to turn sideways so that your shoulder is pointing toward the person you're boxing, and in that way you can keep your chin and face down behind your shoulder, which can also be used to ward off blows. Now, if you keep your knees flexible, bendy that is, and use your feet in what they call footwork to move around in and out of the disaster area, you can move away from getting hit. And then every once in a while you want to go on the offensive, that is, you want to make jabs at your opponent and try to hit him where it hurts. Well, now as I said, one short lesson isn't going to give you a passport through the toughest part of town. But maybe sometime when that big kid starts that business again, you might just surprise him. Give him a good one. Because the one thing funny company kids don't stand for is bullies. Right, gang? Right! Super Chief Spot Belly and Juniper sneaking up on us again. Well, let's go. Oh, boy. Wait for me. Uh, did I told you that kid is glutton for punishment? Oh, boy, those Indians. Mm, me learn this from cowboy. <laughs> Come and get it, smarty pants. Oh, yeah. Good little heroine, Violet. Why don't I mind my own business? And now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company.
Once upon a time, on the edge of a deep, dark forest, lived two children named Hansel and Gretel. They were poor, and one day their mother sent them into the forest to gather wood and berries. Come, Gretel. We will go into the forest to gather wood and berries. All right, Hansel. The farther they went into the forest, the darker it got, and Gretel said, Oh, I'm so frightened. Will you hold my hand, Hansel? Of course, little sister. I will take care of you. Then all of a sudden, a beautiful butterfly came by. Oh, let's follow that butterfly. I'm afraid we'll get more lost. We won't if we leave a trail. Here, break these pieces of bread, and we'll trace our way back to here. And that's what Gretel did. But Hansel was so interested in the butterfly, he didn't notice a big green bird that was following. Hmm, how nice. Those children left some crumbs of bread for me. Hmm. That looks like a monarch butterfly to me. Oh, Jasper, I mean Hansel. What's so special about a monarch butterfly? The monarch is a very interesting butterfly, Violet. I mean Gretel. I'm sure, Hansel. I'm sure. You see, the eggs of the monarch hatch into a very colorful caterpillar that just loves to live in and on the milkweed plant. Oh, he's crawly, but pretty. In fact, if it weren't for the milkweed, the monarch butterfly would be in very bad shape. He loves it. Well, the caterpillar, or larvae, goes into the pupal stage. He knits or weaves himself a cocoon or shell in which he goes to sleep. And while he sleeps, a wonderful change takes place. He changes from a caterpillar, or pupae, into a butterfly. And when he comes out and his wings dry off, he takes flight. Oh, a pretty, pretty butterfly. But no matter where the milkweed is, where he was born, the monarch butterfly, without even knowing why he does it, he and all his brothers and sisters and friends fly to one particular area of the world and they have a convention. They all come together at the same place. They actually form a blanket of butterflies over the trees in this whole area. Oh, how beautiful, a butterfly blanket. And they all get together in this one place at the same time every year without fail, just before they all take flight to the south and to the warmer climates for the winter. Gee, even butterflies are interesting the way you talk about them, Jasper. I mean, Hansel. Well, the children were so interested in the butterfly, they didn't notice a wicked witch behind them. <laughs> Look at those brats in my forest. <laughs> I will take them to my gingerbread house and make mincemeat out of them. <laughs> I hate kids. <laughs> and off the wicked witch went. Hmm, this calls for action. Oh, I will pop you into the oven and make gingerbread cookies out of you. <laughs> but the good green bird had other plans. There she is. Give that witch the works. <laughs> You saved us! And I've turned the breadcrumbs into diamonds and rubies, so you'll be poor no more. And the wicked witch... She'll be turned into gingerbread herself. You think this is just a fairy story? Boy, it's hot in here! <laughs> Show What Do I Do? 
Are you ready, panel? Ready! Ready, go, <laughs> go, Fine. Will our guests please sign in? Welcome to What Do I Do, Mr. Campbell. Uh, what does the X stand for? Tom, I'm a very bad speller. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tom Campbell. You know how we play the game. If our panel fails to guess your occupation, you will win a stick of bubblegum. We'll start the questioning with, uh, Dr. Todd. Uh, have you ever been in North Africa, Arabia, or Mongolia? This is the first time I've been out of the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You can go six weeks without water. I couldn't go five minutes without water. <laughs> I got a leak in my radiator. Oh. <laughs> you are a ship of the desert. No. I get seasick when I see sand. Aha! I know. I see that camel guy before. I go inside and collect first prize bubblegum. All right, does anybody know what Tom Camel does? I do, I know. Pay me bubblegum. Tom Camel is the champion. <laughs> no Budapest bully is going to jip me out of my bubblegum. Well, you've asked 500 questions and nobody has come up with the correct answer, so I'll have to tell you, Tom is a champion racer and he has movies to prove it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Oh, boy, yes. The first time I saw him was at a very horsey affair in California, where they have an awful lot of fun. But uh, what about the camel race? First, there was the jumping. The riders took their horses around the ring, rode at the jumps, and up and over. And then they'd raise the barriers and jump again. Yeah, but what about the camel race? The camel race? How did Tom become a champion? Then there were the ostrich races, and were they funny? <laughs> yeah, the ostriches pull little racing sulkies, and they can really go pretty fast. You wouldn't think they'd be strong enough to pull a sulky and a man, but they did. And if that wasn't enough... The camel race? Well, then there were the clowns, and they were always cutting up. The clowns rode the ostriches bareback. Hey, look at that! <laughs> Those birds are really strong, and it's some trick to ride one. <laughs> uh, what about my picture? All right, and then there were the camel races. Hooray! <laughs> Isn't that exciting? It's hard enough just to get on a camel. But then holding on to one is even funnier. Ooh, come on, get on out there. Get on it. Come on, dog. Hold on <laughs> And I was the champion camel racer of them all. As you can see, those camels are pretty speedy, too. They go lickety split. Well, I never would have believed it if I didn't see it. <laughs> ha, you, not so fast. I could beat you with both legs tied behind you. Let's have a race and see. And the winner will get the bubble gum. Get on your marks. Get set. Go! Hey! Oh, hey! Camel cheated. I win bubble gum. Give me! Well, what do you want? One lump or two? <laughs> Oh, boy! I'm going to win something! I take two! Oh! Ooh. <laughs> and now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company! We've already got electric lights. 
today we are going to make candles because today they are going to turn off our electricity because yesterday we didn't pay our light bill. Ooh. Um, uh, I got an idea. Well, what's that? Let's make candles. Oh, Terry. Oh, that's what Buzzer said. We can sell the candles to get money to pay our electric bill. Ha <laughs> ha. That's what they think. I will steal the candles and sell them myself. Who knows how to make candles? I do, I think. First, some wax. Okay, Buzzer, lay the string out on the floor. There, now we just take it around like this. Over here and then... There. Uh, that doesn't look much like a candle to me. Yeah, if we had some anchovies, we'd have a wax pizza. Oh, Terry. <laughs> hey, I know. Maybe we should see if the Weisenheimer has any pointers on how to make candles. Do I? Now, this is one way of making candles. There are lots of other ways, too. But in this method, you start with a great big hoop, a rim of metal or even wood that you hang from a harness-like arrangement. Now the hoop ought to have little hooks all along the rim of it. And it's to these hooks that you attach the lengths of string or braided cotton or linen or whatever will be the wick of your candle. Then you need paraffin or beeswax or a mixture that we'll just call wax. Wax? That's right. Wax. W-A-X. All right, we got our wax. Now what? Well, you melt the wax. You can have all colors. And then you take small amounts of it and pour the melted wax down over the wick. Ooh, look how fast that man's hands are. That's it. You pour and pour and pour on one wick after another. And turn the hoop as you go so the wicks and the wax will have a chance to dry and harden. And then you pull the wicks taut to make this beginning candle straight. And then you keep on pouring and pouring, adding layer on layer of wax till you've built up the size of candle you want. <laughs> Gee, we were doing it all wrong on the floor. Well, there are all kinds of ways to make candles, chum. Now, these were poured into molds. Then there are combination methods where you start with the molded candle and then add drippings for a nice artistic effect. But you should always be careful and have mom or dad or some grown-up help you when melting wax as that usually means fire. And fire, as you know, means danger. Right, gang? Right! By now, they should have enough candles made for me to steal. Well, if it isn't our old buddy, Billy Laguna. <laughs> oh, what's he up to? Hey, 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 I got it. Hand me a mallet. <laughs> Wait! That wax belongs to me! It was stuck to me and it's my wax! Give me my wax! You want wax? I want wax! Okay, gang, let's give him his wax! Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Snatch that monkey and trade him. <laughs> My monkey! 
She's a gone. Oh, mercy. I'll call the funny company detectives on my Jasper radio. <laughs> Funny Company, this is the newest wrinkle in the space program. These baseball-sized satellites. If we can get two or three thousand of these up in orbit around the Earth, they'd act as relays for a global television and radio network. Golly! And we want you to test the instrumentation, Jasper Park. Well, thank you, sir. Funny Company, this is Shrink and Violet. Somebody just stole a monkey from Mr. Rosalini, and I think it was Billy Laguna. Now we start with monkey business. I give you lessons on climbing up the second floor of Space Center and stealing one of those baseball satellites. Watch. You climb up, you tippy toe the long edge, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> you now see first human banana split. <laughs> Why would he steal a monkey to get into the Space Center? Oh, they can be trained to do lots of things, even steal. And for monkeys, or chimpanzees, why space work is nothing new at all. The chimpanzee, or the chimp as we in the science field call them, can do remarkable things with the proper training and patience. First, the chimp is trained to operate levers which cause a light to glow on an instrument panel. Oh, I see. The chimp pushes the right-hand lever, and if he pushes it the correct number of times, that light goes on over to the left. Right, buzzer. Then the chimp is trained to turn that light off by pressing the lever on the left. All this time, the scientists are measuring his reactions, and they record the results for later evaluation. Oh, doesn't that poor little monkey ever get hungry? Very good question, Violet. And the food reward is the next step. When the chimp presses that lever the correct number of times, food is dropped into the tray on his left. The chimp has to repeat the same thing time and time again to get enough to eat. He sure learns fast. The next step is to train him to receive his food reward through a mouth tube. He playfully pounds the lever, and doing it correctly, he is fed through that tube. He soon learns that for a big meal, he must do it correctly many times. Golly! <laughs> Patiently, the scientist fits him into his future space home, his space cockpit. He must be securely fastened in, but still be able to operate certain levers and be fed. Meanwhile, the scientists have many measuring devices wired into the chimp's spacesuit to make sure he's comfortable and in good physical condition. They check his pulse, temperature, blood pressure, and other things that will help our scientists make it safer for our astronauts in their space travel. Okay, little Clyde, you go up to second floor, look for a little black baseball satellite. We'll catch Belly Laguna red-handed and put him in jail. Here you are, fella. All the baseball satellites you want. Only now, they've got cement in them. You hold the monkey, throw down my satellite. All right, so I'm a bad catcher. I just wanted one. Ow! Oh. Hey, you do good work, Clyde. Yeah. Ow. And now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company. Cornerstone for the new wing, we blow him up. <laughs> Get this country in plenty Dutch with Bagovia. 
Just think, our own Polly Plum is the official translator for the ambassador of Bagovia. And we better hurry and finish decorating this stand before they finish the tour. Oh. What's the matter? Well, I haven't any more thumbtacks in my briefcase. I'll go inside the museum office. And I'll just finish tying this. Oh. Ha, ha, ha. Boss, look. Got briefcase just like ambassadors. When he lay cornerstone here, we switch and his goes boom. Oh, mercy. The ambassador asks, is this the last room his feet are tired? No, oh, yes, indeed. He got to get that cornerstone laid. He asks, what's this all about, natural history? Uh, yes. Polly, why don't you tell him about that exhibit? The sheen of the little lizard known as the Chuckawalla. Oh, I'd be glad to. Mr. Ambassador, now suppose you put the get him a note that Chuckawalla. Oh, Chuckawalla, Walla, Walla, Walla. Why, Chuckawalla is an Indian name for this little desert lizard, Your Excellency. Well, they're widely distributed throughout the southwestern United States. You'll always find them in rocky areas. You know, they're great sunbathers, and they just like to sit out on a rock and bask. <laughs> they don't look it, but they can move with great speed in contrast to their great patience when lying still. A full-grown Chuckawalla can grow to 20 inches in length. And being a vegetarian, oh, they are great favorites as food among many Indians. Well, sir, sometimes when danger threatens these little fellers, like the shadow of a bird announcing an impending swoop to capture Mr. Lizard, why, they scurry into the cracks and crevices and kind of puff up, and you couldn't budge them with a crowbar. Now, a relative of the Chuckawalla is the ferocious-looking horned toad, who really isn't a toad at all, but a lizard. The horned lizard is the correct name. They're friendly, docile animals, but as pets, you always want to remember those horns are not soft, but sharp and spiny and hard. They all love to eat ants, even the tiny young horned lizards, which are no bigger than a dime. Their ability to scramble quickly for cover and their close resemblance to the coarse soil or the sand on which they crawl help them in keeping hidden from enemies. The horned lizard, your excellency. <laughs> oh boy, boss, I can hardly wait to switch these briefcases. I'll just give them Terry's briefcase instead. Well, right this way, Ambassador, to the cornerstone and speaker stand. Most of that won't step up. Oh, Terry, I'm so scared. Listen. Hey, what you got in there, an alarm clock? No, listen. And now, Mr. Ambassador. Violet, give me that ticking briefcase and we'll play like it's the Ambassador's for a few minutes. The Ambassador says you've got a nice place here. Oh, boy, boss, this is it. Hmm, he must carry alarm clock to keep him awake. Let's go before Bum really wakes him up. He says he likes our town because it's so quiet. He asks, what was that noise? Tell him it was just a little backfire from a car. <laughs> Boss, talk to me. Bailey, you bug me. Now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company. Wading. Think. 
they don't have wading in the Olympics. Swimming and diving, but no wading. Well, I'm starting at the bottom. <laughs> How deep is it? Oh, it's not deep. See? Oh! Oh! oh, man overboard! Everybody stand back! I'll save her! I'll save her! Fear not! I shall save you! I don't need saving. It's only up to my ankle. Ah, don't be a spoil sport. Let me save you. Let me be a hero. Look, Jerry, don't get so dramatic. Mary is perfectly safe. Oh, gee whiz. Nobody will let me be a hero. Come on, Mary. Take my hand, and I will pull you safely to shore. If you want to be a hero, why don't you join the Coast Guard? Coast Guard? What's that? Come on into the clubhouse, and we'll get the Weisenheimer to show us. Weisenheimer, 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 Rickety Rat. Crank it up and get the facts. On the Coast Guard. Weisenheimer here. So let's guard the coast, as our Coast Guard does every day of our lives. And with boating becoming more popular, the action gets heavier, as in this kind of situation. A small boatman with engine trouble, or perhaps out of gas. Boy, that's trouble with a capital T. Right, Terrence because the pounding surf and riptides can drive his boat ashore where it'll get all torn up. So, luckily, with his radio telephone, he calls for help from the U.S. Coast Guard, which dispatches aid in two forms. First, the helicopter. These fearless pilots stand ready to take to the air on a moment's notice. Then also, a speedy Coast Guard cutter is dispatched. This is an 82-footer, the kind of vessel used in World War II in anti-submarine warfare. They're really wonderful, fast and seaworthy craft. Well, the helicopter arrives and drops a line to the disabled boat and tows it out to sea, away from the danger of the waves breaking ashore. Well, I'm a big green bird. <laughs> yes, you are. And then the cutter, after arriving and circling, pulls ahead of the tow, and the helicopter passes the tow on to the cutter, which brings the boat back to port. Helicopters help in another way, too. Skin and scuba divers get into trouble occasionally and are helped by the county lifeguard patrol, who rescue these divers and pull them aboard their boats. But when the rescued parties are injured, another call is made to the Coast Guard, which brings the Coast Guard helicopter again, and when it arrives, the Coast Guardsmen lower a stretcher and then haul the injured man aboard for a speedy return to medical aid. Weisenheimer, over and out. Oh boy, that's for me. I want to be one of those Coast Guard helicopter jockeys. Help! Help! Oh, someone's calling for help. Ow! Oh my goodness. It's shrinking Violet. She's fallen into the water and shrunk. Oh, I'll save her. I'll save her. <laughs> Where did you go? I thought you were going to save Shrink and Violet. I did, I did. I called the Coast Guard. Uh, they ought to be here any minute. <laughs> 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 and now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company. We have a company that you can join for free. And kids in every neighborhood belong. It's the funny company, cause it's just for fun, you see. to do. Story! Fun! Toys! All sorts of things of interest and fun for girls and boys! <laughs> 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 <laughs>
shh, shh, everybody. Jasper's writing a mystery story. A story writer? I've heard everything. Take this down, Violet. I shall never forget my most interesting case. The Kawati Mundi spy case. The what? Shh. I was serving in the Secret Service when I received word by phone one day. Yes, sir. You say this famous scientist is staying at Mrs. Ritz's rooming house and an attempt will be made to steal a secret formula he's carrying? I'll stop it. Check, Chief. And I left for Mrs. Ritz's forthwith. Nick with you mean? <laughs> Meanwhile, Mrs. Ritz had learned of a peculiar craving of her scientist rumor. He was a between meals apple muncher. He was eating her out of house and apple. But someone else had known of this craving too. Ha <laughs> ha! Boy, I got trained animal to climb in window, swap those apples for these apples I dipped in sleeping potion, and when scientist conks out, I snip secret papers in his room. Hmm. Human footprints, and those of a raccoon or a coati mundi. Brother, it couldn't be a plain old raccoon. It had to be something nobody knows about. Oh, shh. What's a coati mundi, Jasper? Why do you encourage him, Violet? The coati, or coati mundi, is a close relative of a raccoon. A smallish mammal with an upturned snout that's useful in rooting for food. They have long striped tails that they carry erect, and lots of times, You'll see them wandering around in bands. Yeah, in bands or in orchestras. Come on, come on. Shh. Pardon me. The coati walks on the soles of his feet and looks like a combination of an anteater, baboon, raccoon, and pig. He's not so nice looking, but when you start with a young one, they make very nice pets because they're quite funny and clownish. Yeah, I wish you were funny and clownish. <laughs> Kowatis will eat nuts and berries. But more often, they like to use their pig-like snouts and strong webbed and clawed front paws to root up insects like scorpions, spiders, tarantulas-like or small rodents, larvae, Snakes, centipedes, even small birds. Gee, they're regular little sweethearts, ain't they? Although you'll find them in desert areas, some coatis are jungle dwellers and live in trees. And like their cousins, the raccoons, they like the water. And this is important to my story. Raccoons wash off any food they eat. Raccoons wash off any food they... They do? Evidently, this dastardly Belly Laguna had trained this animal to do his foul deed. Here, baby, climb up tree, across branch, trade his apples for these sleepy ones, and I'll be in hall outside scientist's room waiting for him to sleep. What did you do, Jasper? Nothing. Nothing? Watch. Ha, ha, ha. He's asleep by now. Tiptoe in and... Stop you! Oh! Ah! Oh! Ah! I knew this would happen. But he should be asleep. My raccoon swapped for poison apples. They weren't poisoned by the time he got them up here. Oh. oh! No, because a raccoon always washes off any food he finds. Some story. <laughs> Billy Laguna should have known that. Or instead of raccoon, maybe should have used Coati Monday. <laughs> And the funny company can make them and sell them. 
sell them for eight or nine cents each. When we get enough acorns. Yeah, but it's getting dark. And these woods are scary. Oh! Boy, scary, I'll say. And when it's just a little darker, I put on grizzly bear suit, jump out at them, they run and leave behind portable Weisenheimer, and I snitch it. <laughs> that was a timber wolf. Oh, I'm so scared. And there are grizzly bears in these woods, too. Leaping electrons. And you've broken one of the first laws of the funny company. What's that? No business after dark. When it's twilight, you should be home. Shame on you. Oh, you don't have to rub it in, Weisenheimer. Wolves and grizzly bears. Oh, don't be afraid, Violet. I know a guy who crossed a parrot with a grizzly bear. Did it talk a lot? Not much, but when it talked, you listened. <laughs> it didn't help you, huh? No. You still scared? Yes. And we are lost. No stars. No moss on the trees. If only we had a compass. Say, how about the wise one? Weisenheimer, Weisenheimer, brickety back. Crank it up and get the facts on how to make a compass. Yeah, how? Well, always glad to oblige. Well, a compass to point north. We'd need a needle, that one. a battery, here on this torch, a cork, in my thermos, some wire, and an eyedropper or straw. Got him. Well, you're just lucky. <clears throat> First, you put the needle in the eyedropper or straw. Any kind of small tube will do. Then you take the wire and start wrapping it around the tube with the needle inside. You do this to keep the wire from touching the needle directly in what you're about to do. You make a tight coil, many turns around the tube. You wrap up the whole tube in wire. Then, to keep it from unwinding, you put some tape on each end. There. You have the eyedropper with the wire wrapped around it and the needle inside. Now, you're going to magnetize the needle. Make a tiny magnet out of it by passing a current of electricity through the coil of wire. The needle is steel, and if you pass the electricity around it, through the wire, long enough, the steel needle turns into a magnet. So, you fasten the ends of the wire to the opposite poles of your battery. My flashlight battery is a big one. Good. And then when you've done that for a while, you'd loosen the wires. Take the needle out. Then you cut a thin slice of cork and tape the needle to it. And you float this assembly in a saucer of water. Notice, the needle always wants to point one way, no matter which way you try to redirect it. It's pointing to the magnetic north pole. It's pointing north. And to check this, you put a regular compass next to it. And see, its pointer goes the same way as your emergency compass points. And this is the same principle at work in the manufactured compasses we know like the ones they use for ships or aircraft. Well, let's get to work. But you could ask me. What? North is that way. Oh, well, let's go and get out of here. Oh, boy, here they come. I'll practice my growl. Growl. How about that? I'm better than I thought. I... Uh... <gasps> Sweet, that bear is taking care of his sick friend. Gee, I didn't know they had polar bears down here. Polar bears? If he isn't, he's the whitest grizzly bear I've ever seen. And now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then.
Hey, gang, that was the little airport outside town. Some no good Nick was trying to rent a plane to fly him over the border. Belly Laguna. Who else? Come on, let's go to the airport. And we can pick up Trink and Violet on the way back. She's selling vegetables out at her grandma's farm. And that's right next to the airfield. Tomatoes, carrots, cabbage, and nice fresh vegetables. Oh. Hey, girly, you see some me looking cuss come by here? No, sir, what did he do? No, he was taking pictures of our space center and missile site out here. Mercy, that sounds like... <gasps> What's that moving out there in the cabbage field? Ha! Oh, I got the complete pictures of missile site and space center. Now, with gun, I force airplane guy to fly me out of the country and back to the forces of evil. Oh, dear! Ha! It's you, Shrinkin' Violet. I'll catch you and take you out of the country. Go! Oh. Hmm, wonder what Belly Lacuna wanted that plane for. Well, I didn't know they had passenger service at that little airport. They don't. It's private planes, mostly, and crop dusters. Crop dusters? I didn't know the crops got that dusty. They had to be dusted all the time. I mean... I meant dusting the crops with insecticides, Terry. Insecticides? Yes. Poisons to kill insects. Oh, what do you got against insects? <laughs> oh, my, Terry. <laughs> insects and caterpillars and worms and such cause losses to the crops we need to feed ourselves and to feed livestock. Why, that's billions of dollars a year. Billions of dollars? It certainly is. And so you see, large fields have to be sprayed in the fastest and the most efficient way possible. And that's where these crop dusting planes come in. Now, the handlers of these poisons have to be very careful that they don't inhale a lot of the insecticides themselves. You mean by inhale to, to breathe it into their lungs? That's right. You see, it's toxic, and this would make them ill or possibly even kill them. They load the spray tank of the plane and get it ready for a run. Most often, the old open cockpit biplane proves to be very useful in this crop dusting work. That's because it's a strong airplane and very maneuverable. Say, maybe I could strap a couple of bug bombs on my back and hire out as a crop dusting bird. Yeah! Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Terry, you're being silly. <laughs> well, anyhow, those crop duster pilots take their planes in low over the crops. They lay down a trail of that insecticide dust, and they can do very big areas and get them completely covered in a very short time, which is quite important when you're trying to save crops from the scourge of those terrible pests. Oh, just a little further, I... Ah! Ha, ha, I hear you, you little secret weapon! Oh, I'm so scared. Caterpillars and big bugs when I'm small. And if I grow back up again, that terrible Billy Laguna. Hey, look, there's Billy Laguna now! Scream again, you little shrinker! Violet must be out there. Look, the crop duster plane. Oh, it's the gang. Run, Violet! Well, it's my plane. They give me a ride after all. Duck, everyone. He's going to dust. <laughs> oh, 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 Well, there's one more funny company service. After the crop dusters come by, we mop up the field. Oh, no. I'm being exterminated. Oh, my God. Another line. Hans, this 
This is our greatest spy work. I am a secret government plant where they invent special paint that makes things invisible almost. It's camouflage paint. Yeah, it sounds good, but how do we get it? They have God. We use you as decoy. You make him chase you. I bop him on head when back is turned and ha 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 ha. That's all. Be there, devil. Golly, that was Dr. Ludwig von Up and Hans Hoff. Oh, those international no goodness. What government plant could they mean? Could be the paint plant on the edge of town that's doing secret work for the Signal Corps. Well, let's go and stop them. Uh, that, that decoy thing. Y yeah, uh, what's a decoy? And what's camo cam camo camouflage? Yeah, what's that? Oh, camouflage, like the army. Right, and as in nature. You see, Mother Nature, the animal and plant world, are the great teachers of camouflage. In the marshes and woodlands, birds, all kinds are among some of the best camouflage artists. The coloring of so many birds is speckled and streaked and differently colored, so that if the bird is in its natural surroundings, it's hard to spot because it's hard to see against a background of bushes and flowers and shrubs and marsh reeds and grasses. In the spring, after the birds and waterfowl have flown north, you have to be very sharp-eyed to see their nest that they build. And very quiet. So you don't scare them away. But if you just sit quietly and watch, you'll spot all kinds of different species. And it's fun to get to know them and identify them. Well, anyhow, they're camouflaged. Or as they say, they have protective coloring to keep their natural enemies from seeing them too easily. This is nature's way of helping animal life, and the birds are given instincts that help save the breed, too. With some kind of ducks, when danger threatens the nest and the young birds, why, the mother bird flies off, playing like she's injured. She pretends she can't run or fly very well, so that the enemy will chase her and not notice the little birds in the nest. The mother bird is being a decoy. Isn't that brave of her? Nature's law. The first thing is to preserve the species. Gee, if you keep your eyes open and really take some time to watch nature all around you, you can learn a lot. And it's interesting. About the most interesting thing in the world. Here we are. Yeah, and look! Oh, the poor guard. They must be inside. Right. We fight them better if them outside get good chance to fight Indian style. Now, how can we get them outside? With a decoy. Oh, Violet! Come back here. Oh, I can't look. Nya, 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 nya. Dr. Von Up couldn't catch me. Ah, oh, Hans, look, that little shrinker. And now... <coughs> she can't run so fast when she's shrinken. <laughs> no. And I'll just cool them off. Look. Harry! Oh. You must have used that secret camouflage paint. And now they're invisible. All right. Then they're all right. <laughs> oh, Hans, I can't see you, but do those arrows hurt you too? Yeah, but only when I laugh. Oh! <laughs> We hope you like our show, and we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company! We have a company that you can join for free. Kids in every neighborhood belong. It's the funny company, cause it's just for fun, you see. So come a running when you hear our song. Come to order, come to order, says our president. And when the funny company meets, here's just what we present. Things to see. And things to do. Stories. Fun. Toys. All, All sorts of things of interest. This is some hotel. <laughs> Just think, us 
staying at the swank of Beverly Beverly. And we owe it all to Shrinking Violet, who's going to be a movie star. Yeah, we hope. Jasper's still up in the room? He sure is. Do you think he can get the portable Weisenheimer working? I think so. He brought the most important parts along. Ah, uh, you see, that's why I'm here. If he can make it really portable, I will port it out of the country. Hey, who's that? Must be a sultan and his bodyguard. Where you going, Terry? Oh, I want to see how the doorman handles his camel. Oh, Terry. <laughs> What do you think that Sultan is doing here? As Sherlock Holmes would say, it's a matter of deduction. Hi, Weisenheimer. Glad you're working. Besides, I needed a change. What was that Sherlock Holmes thing? One of the great storybook detectives was Sherlock Holmes. He favored the process of deduction in solving mysteries. This depends greatly on your powers of observation. Let me show you a very simple test. You see this picture only of these hands, and what do you know? That's a baby, and it's mama. Right. That's a deduction. You quickly ruled out things it couldn't be. And these hands. Oh, the nails are shorter on the left hand. Very good. And that's to make it easier for this musician to finger the strings of his guitar. While his right hand plucks with longer nails. And these hands? That's a nice older lady. Yeah, she's worked hard. Probably doing all kinds of useful things for people. And these hands? It's a young man. But you can't tell much else. You could say it's probable that he likes sports. And that's another element of deduction, considering the laws of probability. More young men like sports than not, hence he may. But sometimes just one bit of information isn't at all enough, so you must add other bits. Here are hands, a young man, add to that this information, a camera, and is he a cameraman? Not necessarily. That's right. You must still evaluate information. You must know more. These hands are the hands of a lady. Does she really work as a service station attendant? Pumping gasoline for your automobile? You can't tell. You must evaluate. You must seek and know the facts. Sometimes snap judgments on just appearances are very wrong. We've got to observe and evaluate and then make our deductions. Call for Sheik Razor. Call for Sheik Razor? Well, that must be his name. And look at Violet. The other one is named Hassan Ben Easy. He sure looks it. Look, hands. Sneaky, mean hands. It's Billy Laguna. And those two look like they're just as mean as he is. Oh, that smarts. Well, at least they saved Belly Laguna some money. What do you mean? <laughs> he won't need a manicure for three months. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. shovels to do more digging, leaving Shrink and Violet on guard. But Belly Laguna... Oh, let's watch. I hope the gang... 
gang gets back soon so we can dig deeper. Oh, somebody's coming. Boys, I hit enough bows and arrows there to make original Indian uprising look like Tiddlywing's game. What do you want us to do, pale, pale face? Go on warpath again, wipe out whole country. Then wonderful bunch of guys come in and run things. <laughs> the forces of evil way. Is this guy for real? Oh, that nasty old man. I'll have to do something. Woo! <laughs> Alice, come back! Uh, Indian spirits, not like your forked tongue. Boys, we aren't afraid of little old spirits, are we? <laughs> what do you mean, we, pale face? Not much farther, gang. Who knows? Maybe we find old Indian arrowheads and tomahawk. And maybe real Indian clothes and headdresses and... No, if this really old campground not find clothes made of deer hide, all rot away by now. And when you think of all the trouble the Indians go to to make a deer hide usable as a piece of clothing, you realize why it's so valuable. Of course, you start with the deer, and that's hard enough to find. Then, when you've skinned the carcass, you dry the skin, but right away you soak the skin. The Indians tie it to a tree trunk or a branch or tree root in a stream, and the water washes and softens the hide for some days. Then, you have to tan the hide and scrape the fur or hair off the hide. You kind of give it a shave with the side of a sharp rock or a piece of bone or clamshell-like or a knife. You use the chemicals of a dead deer's brains and other vital parts to tan the hide. Tan it? Like a suntan? No. Tan it to change the chemical makeup of the hide from animal skin to leather. Ooh. Then you really have to work the leather. Work it? Pull it and stretch it, and soften it, and really make it very pliable. That is bendy and soft, and not stiff and hard. And after you've worked on it a long, long time, and if you've done a good job, well then maybe an Indian squaw can make you some clothing out of the leather, some leggings, or a vest or something. But because it takes so much time and work to make a deer hide usable, it's worth almost as much to an Indian as a fine woven rug that takes a long, long time to make, too. It's not the material, but labor. You might say so. Oh, here comes the gang. Super Chief, Phyllis, listen. Look, there. Rise up and wipe out no good kids like them, the funny company. Come on, you Indians. We charge. Like we say, what do you mean we, pale face? Him should know better than lead Indians against the super duper super super chief of all. <laughs> what he say? What he say? Him say Indians ought to tan your height, but got no use for rat skin. A comic Indian yet? <laughs> <laughs> And now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company. Report about the desert. 
What's wrong with that? Yeah, the Weisenheimer can tell you about it. Yeah, but I have to show pictures and maps and models of things. Well, I'll tell you about the desert and the gang can help draw the pictures for your lecture. Yeah, but do any of you know anything about the desert? I do. I was lost in the desert for a whole week. When was that? That was in school, too, in kindergarten. I was studying sand pile. What happened? Well, I shrank down one day and I was lost in the sand dunes. I wandered for days, lost without food or water. I didn't sleep for seven days. Gee, didn't you get tired? No, I slept nights. <laughs> oh, come on, what were the jokes? Let's think about my speech. Well, would it help if we showed a ship of the desert? What's a ship of the desert? A camel. What do you know about a camel? Why, well, know what's in that hump on his back. What's in it? A spare leg and a jack. Oh. <laughs> Oops, there she goes. Oh, look. <laughs> well, I could tell about mirages, too. Yeah, a mirage. That's where you park your camel. <laughs> oh, All right, you jokers, this is getting out of hand. Let's start with the facts. Let's start with the country of Arabia, land of King Solomon's mines and other livestock, and also a place where he can stop. Liven up your report, Buzzer. I could act out a story about a Bedouin tribesman lost in the desert. Oh, let's not get too dramatic. Water! Water! Gary! Give me water! You want water? Yeah, I want water! Water! All right, gang, <gasps> let's give it to him! <laughs> oh boy, for a dry subject, that's going to be an awful wet speech. <laughs> Did this Weisenheimer machine yourself, Jasper? Dr. Todd helped. And I helped, too. You're being silly. I know. I'm an alternating current today. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Weisenheimer certainly has that Belly Laguna's number. He lives at the Ritzy Manor. The number there is 342-7891. Area Lord code... Lord knows didn't mean that anyway. How does this machine work? Oh, well, Jasper feeds it brain food. Really? Fish? Nope. Noodle soup. Terry. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, Your Excellency, there are two kinds of computers or electronic brains. But the one that explains some of the basic principles best is the digital computer. And variations of it are used in research, in national defense, and industry. Computers are as close to you as the telephone. Electronic computers are sometimes called data processing machines, and they can do a lot of processing of information or many arithmetic problems in a short time. Large computers can do over 8,000 additions or subtractions in a second. The Weisenheimer has this kind of mathematical component as part of it. Oh, yeah? Well, make the Weisenheimer say goodnight in algebra. Scary! <laughs> it's made up of electrical circuits that set in motion various machines that perform mechanical operations. Remember how the Weisenheimer remembered Mrs. Ritzy's Ritzy Manor phone number? That's right, Dr. Todd. Digital computers have hundreds of circuits in them that are like light switches. They go into on or off positions. 
Now, combine these circuits with the memory storage unit, like tape, and you have quite a speedy question-answerer. It's like the parlor trick. Ask someone to think of a word. Oh, I got one. And by questions that can be answered by yes or no, or on or off, like a computer, you can find the word and the definition that goes with it. Is it before the word October in the dictionary? Yes. Is it before the word flatfish in the dictionary? Yes. Is it before commercial? No. So it's between flatfish and commercial, and you keep on asking until... Is it between compound and concave? Yes. Oh, I guess it's the word compute. Right. By asking no more than 20 or so questions, you can arrive at the one word out of thousands in a dictionary. And when you dial a number on a phone, by the same kind of a series of yeses or noes, ons or offs, you get through to one phone you want in a few million. And electronic brains even count the minutes you talk and automatically punch out your telephone bill. I say. Oh, it's wonderful the things these youngsters know. And boys and girls like Jasper, using their education and imagination and working hard, will invent all the exciting things of the future. And maybe the computers can think and invent things, too. Well, in the sense that new ideas are sometimes new combinations of old ones, maybe computers could make up new things, but... I can invent things. I invented a thing that looks like a pistol. You hold it like a pistol, and it shoots like a pistol. Really? What is it? It's a pistol! <laughs> <laughs> no, not <laughs> take his hat off to a tiny European spider called the diving spider. Although this spider is an air breather like man, it chooses to live beneath the water in a diving bell of its own construction. She does her breathing through openings in her abdomen, and the way the diving spider survives underwater is to always carry a life-giving bubble of air to cover its movements, just like a skin diver carries his aqualung. The construction of the diving spider's underwater house is a marvel of engineering skill. 
Like other spiders, she is equally well equipped for spinning silk. The roof of her house is a network of silken strands, which is securely attached to nearby underwater plants by a series of tie lines. When the roof is firmly anchored, the spider then goes to the surface for an extra large bubble and hauls it down and releases the bubble under the roof of her house. More bubbles are released inside her house and soon they stretch the dome upward until the diving bell is finished. A fine air-filled house where the spider can set up housekeeping and raise a family. There is no need for the diving spider to spin a web to catch her prey. The surface of the water is her happy hunting ground. With this kind of life, the diving spider doesn't care if she ever sees dry land. Man's diving bell is the same principle, only the shell is made of steel. Got it? Here we are. Then I'm all set. Polly, open your briefcase and give me the thimble from your sewing kit. Sure, bud. Here it goes. <laughs> such a fresh guy. Yoo-hoo, nice kiddies. I, Belly Laguna, have a surprise for you. Oh, hello, Mr. Laguna. Come on in. Well, here comes trouble. Terry. I wonder what's a surprise. I have something for you to use to put on a funny company rodeo. I'll bet it's a bum steer. No, wise guy, it's a fine horse. <laughs> Quiet, silver bullet. Gee, we wouldn't know how to have a rodeo, Mr. Laguna. That could be dangerous. We'd need a lot of training. Nonsense. We'll train horse to fake it for you. For a while there, I thought he was going straight. Please, Weisenheimer, no battle of wits today. It would be unfair. You're unarmed. I'm not myself today. I noticed an improvement. Do you mean we could train a horse to look like he was a bunking bronco from a rodeo? Why not? Oh, come, come, old chap. This is nonsensical. I've heard you can train animals to do all kinds of things. If you start with something, they do naturally. What do you mean, Mary? Well, like the ducks that play the piano. <laughs> One moment, silver bullet. You're kidding, Mary. No, I've heard that, too. You can train animals like the ducks Mary was telling you about. Oh, yes. I've heard about them, too. And if you'll look this way, there. I just happen to have a pictorial record of the very same ducks Mary spoke of. You see? A whole flock of them. And if you start with what they just do best, 
naturally, you can lead them through the performance of some duty or routine. These ducks, you know, kind of scoop up corn and other food with their bills. So, the people who train them slowly changed the how and where they got their food. They lined it up in a row and put it higher than the ground. <laughs> and the ducks reached for it. Next, the ducks were trained to reach and pick in a row like that, even when there was no food there. And then they were rewarded with the food afterwards when they did it right. And next, the corn was dangled on a string above the ducks, so they do another trick. They quickly learned how to get the corn and pull the string while doing it. And they learned later that by doing the same trick without the corn, they'd be rewarded afterwards. And that's how these ducks learned to play the piano. <laughs> you mean he's really going to play that piano? By Joe, simply wizard. <laughs> Coming, silver bullet. Hey, is that a fucking Bronco you got tied out there? I don't know why. Well, I was thinking, if it is a fucking Bronco, there's one useful thing we could train him for. What's that? Well, we could train him for the Forest Rangers. Whatever for? Well, like Mary says, if we train him to do what comes naturally, we could tie garbage can lids to his feet, and he could stamp out forest fires. Oh. <laughs> and now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. down in the clubhouse, and we'll do a planetarium show with Shrink and Violet. Uh, all set! Presenting the constellation of stars known as Orion, the hunter. These are the stars, and this is the picture you should imagine. The hunter. Oh, oh hey, that's a very <laughs> Hello? Oh, my, oh, no. Well, oh, well, I'll help in any way I can, and the funny company will, too. What's the matter? Oh, my friend Dr. Polaris was forcibly taken from the Palomine Observatory by some bad men. The Palomine Observatory? I was just testing our telescope by focusing on the telescope at Palomine. Well, look again, Jasper. See what you see. Hmm, a black sedan. They got him, they got him, they got him. And we'll make you help the forces of evil. Yeah, we find out all about the sun from him, but we cause trouble for the girl. You see, Dr. Polaris was doing research on the disturbances on the sun that caused problems here on the Earth. He was? Yes, in particular, he's interested in getting good scenes of the sun's surface when the sun is in eclipse. He uses the giant telescope to see that. Very interesting. Oh, my, yes. He was part of a team of scientists who photographed the sun in eclipse not long ago. You see, the sun was about to eclipse, and the whole North American continent was about the best place to see it. The atmosphere is very clear there, but there are no telescopes. They wanted to use a gigantic plane to observe the eclipse from above the Earth's surface, so there'd be even greater clarity of the air. Well, sir, they worked for months outfitting that plane. 
special portholes and trap doors, special hinging devices that would let the equipment swing freely. Then the delicate instruments began to arrive, special lenses and telescopes, and special tracking devices and measuring and recording equipment. It was just a beehive of activity to equip this plane with all the most modern observation tools that modern science could supply. And then the scientists came aboard. Some even wanted to get their own pictures for their own personal photo collections. And the plane flew above the frozen mountain ranges and the air was clear above. And at a certain time, here's what they saw. As the moon passed between us on the earth and the sun, so that it was a perfect masking out or blotting out of the sun, why they got pictures of a halo of fire leaping from the sun's surface. Those are gases burning. And those gases were leaping and exploding hundreds of miles above the sun's surface. Golly, it must be the biggest thing ever. Dr. Todd, look, is that your friend Dr. Polaris? It is, but how did... I saw those crooks leave the observatory in a car and followed them to this house with my telescope. <gasps> We've got to help! Here's what we do. Dr. Todd and the police should be outside of that house by now. Ready, Violet? Ready, Dr. Todd? Ready, Jasper. Okay, Violet. On now, Dr. Polaris. We plan to send a big puff of smoke in atmosphere to blot out sun and freeze the Earth. You tell us what we... Look, it's a monster! Really scare them, Violet. Help! Let me out of here! Here they come! All right, hands up, all of you. Dr. Goodhart, Dr. Polaris, you're saved. What strange phenomenon. Weird figure on Wall of Rome. Well, we've heard of a man on the moon, but this time the girl on the moon saved the day. Girl on the moon? Impossible. <laughs> and now it's time to go. We hope you liked our show. And we'll be back as quick as one, two, three. And when we meet again, we hope you'll be here then. Cause now you're in the funny company. Country rabbit working in the city In the Easter Bunny goodie factory But as the holiday nears I strip my gears Cause I got an egg allergy Oh, I'm Egbert the sneezing rabbit Achoo, achoo, achoo Though I wheeze and I sneeze And shake in the knees The eggs must go through Now I started in the hard-boiled division where the eggs are cooked and dipped in dye. But just the sight of a shell makes me feel unwell. I itch and I twitch and I cry. Oh, I'm Egbert the sneezing rabbit. 
Do a chew, a chew, a chew. In the jelly bean department, I did better. Checking everyone for color is no trick. But I got vertigo then, for once again, just seeing an egg made me sick. Oh, I've Egbert, the sneezing rabbit. You chew, chew, I chew. Though I wheeze and I sneeze and shake in the knees, the eggs must go through. Now I've got the job that helped me solve my problem. I deliver eggs and handle them with care. And when I'm out on my route, I'm never without a gas mask to filter the air. Oh, I'm Egbert, the sneezing rabbit. Hello, hello, hello. Now life is a breeze with nary a sneeze, and the eggs will go through. Well, this is it, Mr. Lincoln. I even named my invention. See? The Speedy Ball. Gollikins. Is that for little old me? Jasper made them for all of us, but we want you to have the first Speedy Ball. You just step on here, and to go forward, you move your feet out. And to stop, you make your feet pigeon toe in, like this. Yeah, and you steer with body English. <laughs> Doctor says stay away from these kids I'm allergic to for a while, and I stop sneezing. But I can't resist. I got to snitch one more thing. Gee, gang, much obliged. Now I'm off on my appointed rounds. Nor snow, nor sleet, and all that stuff. Ha-ha! <laughs> 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 Dally Laguna must go through, too. Out of my way! I got a speedy ball of my own and I stole it! Ha-ha-ha! Look, he looks just like Egbert! Yeah, Oli Belly is a pretty dumb bunny! Oh, why didn't I follow doctor's orders? Hope you'll be here then, cause now you're in the funny company!